Hey everyone, I'm visiting New York for a couple days and it's a beautiful day over here in Manhattan. And so like any other normal person, of course my first thought was what a beautiful day to talk about messy code and some of the patterns of engineers who write messy code and how you can avoid those mistakes. There are a lot of things that you can get away with not doing as an engineer. Maybe you don't have to be that good at writing meetings. You don't have to be very effective at communicating updates to your manager or to your team. But if you write bad code, then that is a cardinal sin of being an engineer. You have to figure out how to write high quality code. The core mindset to adopt if you want to avoid writing messy code is just to be empathetic. And empathy comes in the form of being empathetic to your future self, to your team, to other people who haven't even joined the team yet. You want to make sure that all the code you write is easy for them to maintain and understand and also review when you're putting it up for code review. Remember, you don't get extra credit for using the most clever code imaginable, right? Your priority should be to make sure the code is understandable by the humans on your team. And so it's better to prefer simple code over clever code. Here are five patterns of engineers who write messy code. So pattern number one is having a low quality or unreadable pull request. When I'm talking about messy code, I'm actually also referring to the thing which happens right after you write the code. There are kind of three distinct phases to what happens when code is written. Immediately after you write the code is the dress up portion, which is preparing it for code review, adding the context, screenshot, context about what you did. Next is the code review portion, which is where you get feedback from your team about what you could do better or about different updates you might need to make. And the third portion is landing the code. And so what you'll find is that for a new engineer, someone who's uh, maybe relatively inexperienced, they're going to not spend that much time on the first portion, which is okay, after they have the code written, they'll quickly put it out there. They'll yeet it out the code, and then they'll spend a lot longer in that second phase, which is about getting feedback. So they'll have like two, three, four rounds of review of getting feedback from their tech lead, their manager, other people on the team about how they could write their code better. And then finally, they might spend a couple more days taking their time to actually land the code, rebase it, fix merge conflicts, and then finally it hits mainline. On the other hand, compare that to a more senior engineer, what you'll find is that they spend a lot longer in that first portion. So they're gonna spend a lot more time adding a ton of context about what they're doing, why they're doing it, adding a test plan. They might even go above and beyond and add a screenshot, a video of what they've done before and after to make it really clear the impact of the code change and making sure that they've tested it thoroughly, followed all the best practices and so on. And the result of that is that the phase two, the reviewing portion of the code, becomes a lot faster. And the, the last portion also, they act with urgency to quickly check in the code to mainline. And so even though the first step is a lot longer, the amount of time spent in the whole process actually is way lower. Messy code pattern number two is having terrible naming. And I think that when you're in school, you get into the habit of just having horrible, horrible names for code because there's no need to maintain it, right? You write one project, you move on the next month and you have a different project. But when you're in a professional environment, then you have to really focus on communicating clearly what the code is doing and maintaining it over a long period of time. And naming is one of those things which sounds simple, but actually ends up being very difficult. There's that really famous quote, which is that there are only two hard things in computer science, cache and validation and naming. The idea is that you want your variable names to actually be representative of what they're trying to achieve or what they're trying to do in your program. I have a few random tips here. First is that methods and functions should actually have a verb in their name, right? A method is doing something on an object, for example. And so it should actually have an action, a verb associated with that. The second tip is to be consistent with the names you're using. So for example, you might have a function called get result, and then another one called retrieve result, and another one called fetch. So get, fetch, and retrieve are all pretty much synonyms. And so unless they're doing something different, then you should try and consolidate and just use one of the three instead of having all three littered in your code base. Another tip is to actually embed more context in the name of the variable. So for example, you might have a variable called delay time equal five. Um, and that's kind of ambiguous, right? So you might actually want to embed the unit in the name of the variable. So it'd be like delay time seconds five. Keep in mind that as humans, we're not actually typing out every character in a variable name. We have autocomplete and we have IDE features to help us write the code. And so if you have the ability to add one more word or a couple more characters into a method or a variable name to make it more clear, you should always do that. Verbosity is okay if it helps your fellow humans understand the purpose of your variable or method. Messy code pattern number three is to have a monolith in the code base, which is basically a huge block of text, whether that's a file or a module or a class, which is just too big and has too much responsibility. One way to evaluate if this is happening in your code base is to look at the history of that file, so git blame, and look at who are the engineers who are modifying that file. 
And if it turns out that the engineers touching it are actually on completely different teams that don't even talk to each other, then that is a sign of a bad architecture in a monolith, right? So you have a very poor separation of concerns because you're requiring engineers who don't actually work together to have to modify this single file in, in order to get their work done. That's pretty fragile and prone to introducing more bugs and more dependencies. One way I've seen this manifest quite frequently is if you have a utility class, right? So you start off very innocently and you have a file which has a couple of things that you know, don't really require that much context and people can use it. And then over time, it will balloon into a file which has thousands of lines and all sorts of different people and teams are using it. And so that's a sign of something which is not very well thought through and people just dumping their utilities in there without too much idea or concern for how are these things being linked together. This is actually quite challenging to fix on your own because it will probably require refactoring and communication with a bunch of different teams and people. But as a responsible engineer, what I'd recommend you do is actually think about the new code you write. And instead of doing the lazy thing, which is maybe just extending that God file or that utility file, think a little bit more deliberately about how you can add the code in a way such that it's much more clear and compartmentalized. The next pattern I want to talk about is keeping commented code in the code base. And the idea here, I think a lot of engineers will say, hey, you know, there's a chance that in the future we might want to actually use this code. Or, hey, if this feature doesn't ship or we revert back to old behavior, I'll keep this other method or this other variable commented in so it's very easy for us to go back to the previous state. But this is almost never the right thing to do. The whole point of version control is to be able to very quickly and easily go back to the state of the code base at any time in history. But when people want to keep commented code in the code base, it's usually a reflection of them not understanding version control very well or just being too lazy to actually use it. Think about a code base like a human body with muscle and fat. And so when you have a lot of commented code left in a production code base, there's a lot of fat on that code base. And that makes it harder to understand what's happening. There's more cognitive load. And that leads to my final tip about messy code, which is to have too much white space. A lot of engineers will have a bunch of new lines to separate out one portion of the file from the other, with the reasoning being that, oh, these are two very distinct things. And so I want to make sure that to the human, it's very clear uh, you know, what these different parts of the module or class are doing. But if that's true, and there actually are two different responsibilities among that file, then why wouldn't you partition that out into a different method or even a different class? The same logic about reducing fat from your code base applies here. You want to remove white space and make it really easy to understand what's happening. And also keep in mind that we're often going to be using an IDE, an integrated development environment, when we're developing or modifying code. And they're not going to respect white space, right? Like you have to understand the tooling and how are your changes in the code base going to impact that tooling. If you haven't already, then I'd recommend that with your team, you figure out a linter that you can apply to your code base. So a lot of these things around how many spaces should you have between a curly brace and a parentheses, or how many new lines should you have between different methods, a lot of those shouldn't even be up for debate. Once you figure out a style that you're happy with as a team, you run that through every single code change, and then that way all these debates around style or white space can just go away, and you can be a lot more focused on the actual substance of the code review. I hope that was helpful. Those were five patterns of engineers who write messy code. At the end of the day, it, again, it's an exercise in empathy. You wanna make sure the code you write is easy for your future self, your team, other people on the team to be able to understand and maintain the code that you write. So keep these in mind as you're writing code, and you're gonna become a much more productive and impactful engineer. Thanks for watching. I'm gonna get back to enjoying this lovely New York day and I'll see you in the next one.